And if I were your age, I would be thinking very seriously about what it was that drove me to the bank and what it was I learned there. The first thing I'd like to say is that, harking back to my own experience, I grew up in a world in which, for decades, uh, there was uh, one-sixth of the world by the year 2000, a billion people who had 80% of the world's income. And then there were five billion people who were in the so-called developing world that had 20% of the global income. And I took an interest in that 20% through activities in foundations and other things, largely because I couldn't understand how the world would continue in an inequitable distribution of 5 billion having 20% and 1 billion having 80% of the world's GDP. It stuck, stood there in the post-war years with varying numbers, of course, in terms of the global population, but proportionately, that was the sort of relationship, this 80-20, which existed for decades. But came the last decade of uh, the last century and moving into this new century, we're seeing for the first time a swing which now has that 80-20 somewhere closer to 70-30 or 72-28 or some such number. And that is an important and rapid change which has occurred. And it's brought about a change which has been very evident in the way in which international institutions function and in which indeed the global economy functions. So much so that as we look out, the so-called 80-20 that I and my contemporaries grew up with is now looking at a very, very different future. It is the future that you will face. It is a future of 9 billion people on the planet by the year 2050. Of the 3 billion extra that have been added to the planet or will be added to the planet from the year 2000, about 100 million goes to the rich countries and 2.9 billion goes to the developing countries. So come 2050, it's not 1 billion and 5 billion, it's 1.1 billion and 8 billion or close to it. That is a huge change, dramatic change. The other consequential change is that the structure of the economy is being driven both by the population development and also by modern technology which has allowed the conveyance of ideas and innovation to move to the developing world. And so the projections today are that that old 80-20 with which I grew up for decades will become 35-65. 35% for the billion one in the rich countries and 65% for the people in the developing countries. That is turning the world on its head in terms of the world that I grew up in. But it is the world that you're going to work in. And it is not a trivial change. It is a change of monumental importance. So much so that by 2050, China and India, the two countries that I have, uh, of course, the leading countries in the developing world, will constitute 50% <coughs> of the global GDP. 50% of the global GDP. That is the consensus estimate. But let's say we're off 5%, it's 45% of the global GDP. It's nonetheless a monumental switch in terms of economic power. It happened last in 1815 when China and India were 50% of the global GDP. And it happened before that in the year 1500. And in the period from 1815, at various times, it's been approaching that. But with communism and with the change in governance in China and with the greater development in terms of the Industrial Revolution in the West, 
you got to a point where after World War II, China and India were together 2% of the global GDP. So the growth in terms of China and India and of Asia generally is such that it is not just some modulation of former trends. It is an absolutely fundamental change in the way the world is balanced. I remember I was at a, at a meeting of the G, G7, G8, the first time that the people from the developing world leaders were invited. Seven or eight leaders were invited by Jacques Chirac to a meeting that was held in France. You'd be familiar with the fact that the G7, G8 meet once a year in June or July, and generally, uh, until recently, decide what they think is going to happen with the world, and then they might tell a few people outside. Well, it changed at that meeting, and I remember that the first person to speak was Hu Jintao from China, who made a very elegant speech about China and about the growth and about interdependence between China and the rest of the world. The Prime Minister Bajpai from India then spoke, uh, I think probably eloquently, but I couldn't understand his English very well, so, <laughs> so I, 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 I can only assume that it was another brilliant speech. Uh, but then <coughs> President Lula from Brazil got up and said uh, rather charmingly, if only my parents could see me now, I came from a very poor family, and to see myself here with you, <coughs> President Chirac, and with you, the Prime Minister of England, and you, the head of Germany, and you, you detailed the people that were in the room. He didn't mention the President of the World Bank, I want you to know. <laughs> uh, but, 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 but he did mention the other minor people that were there. Uh, <laughs> and, and then he said, then he said, but I'd like you to consider something, and maybe next year you should have your meeting in Brazil. And the reason you should do that is because you should start getting used to the fact that in another 10 or 12 years, five of you are not going to be here. <laughs> uh, and we, you will be replaced by my friend from China and my friend from India and by myself. And, uh, and, and we'd like you to get used to it so that you can come see us. Well, it was sort of prescient because, as you know, uh, when the economic crisis hit, very quickly it moved from a G8 issue to a G20 issue. And now the G8 is part of the past, and the G20 is the new institution that is there. And it again fits into the prospective development of which I spoke, which is that the weighting of the planet is now moving in different directions. Uh, until recently, till we had this crisis, the United States had a sort of 10 trillion consumption. European Union had nine. And Asia and the rest of the developing world had a little less than five trillion dollars. So it was 10, nine, five. And the middle class in, in the world, of whom there are today or a couple of years ago was a billion and a half, roughly, in the middle class. A billion was in the rich countries in that, in that group that I spoke of. And uh, about half a billion in the middle class characterizes incomes of between $10, and $10 and $100 uh, per capita uh, 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 per week, uh, that this, this uh, amount of, of money uh, was um, demonstrated to be heavily leveraged to those richer countries. By 2030, the estimate now is that there will be 3 billion people in the middle class, and of that 3 billion, two-thirds of it will be in Asia. Two-thirds of it. So this is a switch from being a, a fraction, being uh, less than a third to being two-thirds. And that is a pretty dramatic shift. You'll have a middle class in China of a billion people. Billion people by 2050. Middle class. So these are not trivial changes in the outlook. 
these are tectonic shifts in terms of the way the planet works. And as I said to you, as I look at all of you, in my generation, we didn't have to think about that. In the Dean's generation, it was 80-20, or 78-22, or something like that. It was, it, was, it was a balance where you knew you were the rich countries, the powerful countries, and all the organs of running the world were designed to accommodate that fact. But the world that you're going into is a very, very different one. And it's not something that is going to be turned back. It's something that will happen. It may not happen linearly. There may be events that will occur that will disrupt it for three years or five years. And it may not be exactly 65, 35. Uh, it may be a variation of that. But directionally, it is very clear. And there are a couple of observations that I think are interesting beyond that. Uh, but before I get to the observations, let me make one other point about the planet. And that is that there, and I say this in, in the presence of the Dean, because in Africa, of the eight or nine hundred million people that are now there, that will grow to two billion people by 2050. 2 billion out of 9 billion. And the estimates are that the average per capita income for people in Africa at that stage will be between two and three thousand dollars per capita. The same projections would have China and India at between thirty and forty thousand dollars per capita. So you got two to three thousand, thirty to forty thousand. And countries in the so-called rich world, United States, European countries, somewhere between ninety and hundred thousand dollars per capita. I'm not giving you these figures with any sense of mathematical accuracy. They may be off a bit, but directionally they're right. So if you have two billion people living in a continent with two to three thousand dollars per capita, you have China and India. Uh, with more people, three to four billion, uh, three billion, uh, between thirty and forty thousand dollars per capita, and you have the rest of the world somewhere uh, either north of that or in a middle class, somewhere between the two countries, uh, the two uh, areas of the world, you have a basis for instability. Africa is not a continent which is any longer isolated. It's not a place where people are uninformed. It's the fastest growing market for cellular phones. Information, as you, as you would well know, whether it's in the townships or wherever it is, is now passes very quickly. And that's not just in South Africa, that's in the 53 countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And this is not an issue which is going to go away, nor is it an issue which is trivial to those of us that live as we do here. This is a major issue which is not being confronted and which you will have to confront at some stage. And that gets into a second issue which I would like to touch on, which is what is happening with the rest of the world as it looks at this changing dynamic. Having worked in the World Bank and had some familiarity with the whole issue of aid, I know just how tough it is to get people in the rich world to really understand what the responsibilities are, not just as a matter of conscience, but as a matter of enlightened self-interest to try and help development in the developing world. There was established decades ago a 0 0.7 target for foreign aid. My colleague from the former colleague from this activity who was here from a different part of Stanford, as I understand, uh, uh, knows this. And we're now really, after a lot of speeches and a lot of activity, we're starting to get some momentum before the economic crisis of 15 months ago, which we're now 
maybe getting out of, to a degree. But it's now not at 0 0.7, it's about 0 0.2 that we have reached. And there are a lot of statements that are still being made, but in terms of the actual money which is flowing, if you X out the amount of money that are going to the trouble spots in the world today, there is very, very little development. And in fact, the per capita contributions to Africa have been declining steadily for the last 10 or 15 years. So one of the tragedies is that there's great analysis of the issues. There's great understanding of the issues. But these, like the environment, are long-term issues. And political decision-making is essentially short-term. And so you have political decisions which are being taken in terms of this demonstrable development in terms of global balance that certainly, so far as Western countries are concerned, is not being met. What is interesting is to see how the dynamic between Africa and China and Africa and India is developing. Three years ago, for the first time, the summit meetings of the African leaders was held in Beijing. And they swore after that that it was unlikely that they would ever meet again in a Western country. Simultaneously, 400 African businessmen met in New Delhi. And each led to a understanding on the part of both the Chinese and the Indians of having a dimension of their activities geared towards Africa. Of course, there's been an Indian community in Africa, particularly in East Africa, for a long time, and there are now 750,000 Chinese in Africa. And if you're in the business that I'm in, I was recently in an African country where we were involved in a, a, in a real estate development. We went up country to visit this real estate development, and. Um, uh, which was near a university, and I was astonished to find that everybody on the team that was doing the development was Chinese. The uh, architects, the town planners, the builders, everyone was Chinese. So if you go to Africa today, you don't see people who come from Western business schools. You see people from China and from India. And I just raise that as a point. And the second point I would make is that in terms of China and India, in terms of their development, uh, I was trying to get the most recent numbers, and they may be in my, my, my uh, Blackberry, but I haven't looked. But the numbers in uh, 2007 were the following. There were 110,000 Chinese studying in the United States. There are now over 100,000 Indians studying in the United States. So I look around the room, I suppose it's not surprising. There were 11,200 Americans studying in China and 2,800 studying in India. This is madness. It's just madness. And it's a tragedy in terms of the potential for our young people that are still being guided to look towards Europe, to look towards graduate work in British or European universities, <coughs> when the world is telling them <coughs> that the dimensions have changed notably. I was very interested to hear that there's been a recent trip made by some of your students to Asia and another one to the Middle East. But what is needed in today's world is for us to come up with what is the last thing that I'll touch on, which is this historically, the Western countries were able to stay ahead, firstly uh, because of manufacturing. Well, that got taken out and manufacturing moved to Asia. The second thing that happened after that was that in service industries, uh, it moved to the Western countries. And now that's been taken out in terms of 
Asian really dominance in the service areas. And thirdly was in technology, we were able to stay ahead but as is evident to you, and I'm sure from your colleagues and people you know, the technological advance has now shifted as well. So the challenge for our country is, <laughs> what the hell is it that's going to be left for us if Asia's eating our lunch and dinner in terms of the things that we used to be able to do? And it's not just the United States. It is truly that group of the so-called billion plus that were previously the dominant factor who had 80% of the world's GDP. And so I leave you with that issue because as, as people that are going out into the world, if it were me today, the number one thing that I would be thinking about, which is different from when I grew up, is that the 80-20 rule which I had comfortably in my hip pocket is going to be a 35-65 rule. And that puts a challenge of dramatic proportions to anybody who's at a business school today or graduating. And so I was told that I should go for about this time, and I would then be peppered with questions that would be so intelligent that I wouldn't be able to answer them. So, <laughs> so, 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 so if there are questions, I'd be delighted to have a shot at them. Yes, ma'am. My question is, how would you respond to people like Dambisa uh, Moyo's arguments that aid to Africa is actually a bad thing and should be stopped? I think that the methodology of aid is the thing that should be looked at. I think that Africa, first of all, is not a homogeneous place. Uh, with 53 countries, there are some that I think uh, taking to themselves responsibility for management and governance. And there are some that are just very sadly a long way away from it that are essentially corrupt, um, impossible places to have management. And so I think what you need to do is to be selective. The first thing that I have become very impressed by is that there are now a growing number of young Africans, although I look around the room, I don't see too many here, uh, growing number of young Africans who are going overseas for education. And these are black Africans. These are not just white South Africans or white other Africans. And they're coming back and they are trying to find room for themselves both in business and in government. And even in my decade at the bank, I saw a significant move in the development <coughs> of this core of young Africans. And then the question is, to what extent can they be backed by the governments? And to what extent is there a framework in which there's a judicial system, in which there is governance, in which there is an attempt to counteract corruption and to create some sort of meritocracy? And that is happening in some countries in Africa. I would say you could see movement in 15 or 20 of the countries of the 52, 53. And I think it is a trans-African move now. The thing that I failed at doing was trying to get the African leaders who were the most enlightened to try and, and we tried to sp split the continent into quartiles and have the best of leadership deal with the countries in each of these sectors, led by Africans, enlightened African leaders. <coughs> but unfortunately we failed because the presidential system in these countries and the leadership in all the countries just made it impossible for us at that time to try and encourage the development of the best practices to come to the top. But I'm not totally pessimistic because there is a change. But it's not nearly as quick as I would like to see it. And I think that aid going to countries, to answer specifically your question, aid going to countries that will be corrupt and that will waste it is, I hope, going to become a thing of the past. You'll find humanitarian relief going into those countries, but it will not be run by the government. 
and there needs to be a system of carrots and sticks to try and get the countries to change their practice so that the best countries can be rewarded. That, by the way, was something that was brought in in the Bush administration, the rest countries to be rewarded. And say to the others, it's just not acceptable to steal the money that we're giving you. It's going to be a tough road, but I believe we've started on it. And I believe that the best advocates are the enlightened African leaders themselves, not Westerners. I believe that that is now happening. Yes, sir. Um, considering the huge amount of change, especially away from the U.S. that you talked about, can you, uh, can you discuss how you think the World Bank needs to change? Uh, and then also concerning the U.S. President's ability to appoint the leader of the World Bank, does that hinder the ability to change away from the U.S. century? I think that the, um, the old practice, as I'm sure everyone knows here, was that the Europeans appointed the head of the International Monetary Fund and characteristically, the United States appointed the president of the World Bank. Uh, I think that is now a thing of the past. I think that has changed and that it will be uh, an open competition next time. Uh, part of the reason for this is that the appointment of the, person, the president of the World Bank was at a time when the U.S. economy was dominant. Today, that's no longer the case. As I said to you, it used to be 10, 9, 5, or 10, uh, 10 trillion, 9 trillion, 5 trillion for the rest of the world. That is changing. And as it changes, I have personally witnessed in my own time at the bank a definitive change in the way in which groups of countries come together to challenge American dominance. First, it was the Europeans. And then it's the BRIC countries. But it's very, very clear. And so my own judgment is that the next president of the World Bank is, could be American if there's someone dramatic, but it will not be as of right. It will be because that person is notably the best person that you could have. Um, but I think that in both institutions, they're now internationalized. And it is much more likely that you'll have the best in class for both the bank and the fund. Yes? You talked about the <coughs> involvement of China and India in the development of Africa and the African business connections and political connections. And the World Bank is often criticized for you know, not tying aid to environmental goals, to not tying aid to uh, human rights goals. And the World Bank has been trying to move in that direction. At the same time, now you have a second player, a second source of aid or some form of capital that, you know, doesn't really impose that conditionality as of yet. And I was just wondering how you, you know, what, what do you think of that aspect and what does that mean for the next 20 years? Well, I think the first thing is to challenge the first assumption, which is inherent in what you're saying, which is that aid was tied in to environmental or human rights um, conditionality. And I think personally that that was more nominal than it was real. It was increasingly expressed in the last 10 years. But the truth of the matter is that I don't think that there was the hammer to come in to insist. Um, there are all sorts of methodologies that we use to produce arguments as to why you were environmentally moving forward or you were being more innovative in terms of opening up the society to people. I think that it's not something that will change instantly. In history, nothing, by the way, has changed instantly, not in terms of Europe and not in terms of anywhere. But I think that what we are on is on a clear path, which I am sad to say has been arrested, at least in terms of the environment, by the recent economic downturn. Copenhagen was a colossal disappointment, in my judgment, certainly relative to what many of us had hoped for. And the truth of the matter is that leaders in countries, the rich countries, in terms of the allocation of their resources, 
focus appropriately on what are their domestic needs. And because of a downturn in the global economy for the first time in 60 years last year, it has exacerbated the issue about what the hell do we do in terms of getting our own economies going. When that happens, people in Africa or people in less developed countries become secondary. And so what you tend to get are luminous statements, but not a lot of action. And that's why I said to you before, in terms of Africa, the contributions over the last 20 years per capita have been declining. Not trivially, but significantly, 50% decline. And so I think that we need two things. We need a turnaround in the economy. And then, hopefully, we need some global leadership that is thinking beyond a four-year term of political office.